Hi guys, in today's video we're going to take a look at what is mass spectrometry, time of flight mass spectrometry, low resolution mass spectrometry, analysing spectra, an exam style question and finally a summary. So let's begin by talking about what exactly is mass spectrometry. Well, mass spectrometry is a form of molecular chemical analysis and there are many different types of mass spectrometer. I've shown one here for you and you can see we have our mass spectrometer and it's producing what we call a mass spectra. So all these mass spectrometers work on the same principle. They first of all form ions from our sample, those ions are then separated and they're separated according to a mass to charge ratio which is sometimes represented like this where m is for mass and z for the charge. The third step of the process is that the ions are detected and a spectra is produced. Now mass spectrometry is incredibly useful and that's because the spectra that's produced can be used to provide structural information. So for example if we look at this molecule which we know is ethanol, our mass spectra will be able to provide us with information about the different parts of this compound. The mass spectra can indeed therefore be used to identify unknown compounds and it can help us to determine the relative abundance of each isotope of an element, something we'll take a closer look at in this video. So now I've briefly met the idea of mass spectrometry, let's have a look at a specific type of mass spectrometry. We're going to take a look at time of flight mass spectrometry. Here you can see the apparatus required for the time of flight mass spectrometry. We input our sample over here. This tube is called our flight tube and near the end of the tube is where our ions are detected. So now I've had a generalised overlook at the apparatus involved, let's take a closer look at the steps involved in time of flight mass spectrometry. Well the first thing to understand is that the apparatus are kept under a vacuum. This excludes air and prevents our ions that we form from colliding with any air particles. So now we know our apparatus is under air, what exactly happens? Well the first step is we have to form those ions, the process of ionisation. We take our sample and we dissolve it in a volatile solvent. This solvent vaporises easily and the vaporised solvent is forced through a hollow needle. This hollow needle is connected to the positive terminal of a high voltage supply. As the solvent is forced out of this needle we form these tiny positively charged droplets that you can see here. The positive charge of this terminal causes our tiny droplets to lose electrons. The volatile solvent then evaporates from our tiny droplets and as a result the droplets reduce in size. They become smaller and smaller until they reduce to a single positively charged ion. These tiny positively charged ions that we've produced are then attracted towards an electric plate. Now this electric plate is negatively charged and it causes our ions to accelerate. The ions accelerate towards the plate so that all the ions have the same kinetic energy and therefore the large and heavier particles will have a lower speed and the smaller lighter particles will have a higher speed. After our ions have been accelerated they pass through a hole in that negatively charged plate. This forms them into a beam and the beam of ions that we've formed travels along a tube, the flight tube that we took a look at earlier. After our ions travel down the tube they reach our detector and when they arrive at the detector their time of flight is recorded. At the detector the positive ions pick up an electron and in doing so they cause a current to flow. This flow of current that's produced produces a signal and the detector passes this signal onto a computer which generates a mass spectrum and you can see an example of a mass spectrum here. We'll take a look at some mass spectra later in this video and see what information we can take from the mass spectra produced. So now I've had a look at the process of mass spectrometry, specifically time of flight mass spectrometry. Let's take a look at some of the data that's produced and what we can gather from it. We're going to take a look at low resolution mass spectrometry to begin with. You may know that chlorine has two isotopes, where isotopes are atoms with the same number of protons and different numbers of neutrons. Chlorine has two isotopes, chlorine 37 and chlorine 35. Both isotopes have 17 protons, but they differ in the number of neutrons. Chlorine 35 has 18 neutrons, whereas chlorine 37 has 20. 
as you can see, the two different isotopes have slightly different masses. And as a result, the isotopes will have a different mass to charge ratio and were detected separately by our mass spectrometer. Now the data produced and the process of mass spectrometry can be carried out to a high level of precision. It can be carried out to five decimal places. However, when done to one decimal place, the process can be called low resolution mass spec. And as we've discussed the isotopes of chlorine, we're going to take a look at the mass spectra of some chlorine now to see how the two different isotopes are displayed and how we can work out the relative atomic mass of chlorine by taking a look at the relative isotopic abundance. Here I've got the mass spectrum of chlorine. Now we learned in our previous video on isotopes that chlorine has two stable isotopes, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. We can see here on our mass spectrum, we have two peaks shown in blue, and these represent the two different isotopes. We have one peak at 35 for chlorine 35, and one at 37 for chlorine 37. Now you'll notice they're different heights. This is indicating a difference in the relative abundance of these two isotopes. What we mean by that is in nature, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37 are both present, but they're not both present in the same amounts. We can see there's slightly more of chlorine 35 than there is of chlorine 37. So let's go ahead and have a look at the calculations and information we can deduce from these mass spectra. The first is isotopic mass and abundance. So let's first have a look at isotopic mass. So we know that we have two isotopes of chlorine, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. Now we know the isotopic mass can be taken as the mass number. So the isotopic mass of chlorine 35 is 35 and mass of chlorine 37 is 37. Now, in this mass spectrum here, we're actually given the percentages over here. We're given the percentage relative abundance, so it's quite easy to read off. The relative abundance of chlorine 35 is 75% and that of chlorine 37 is 25%. So what can we do with these measurements of relative abundance? Well, we can actually work out the relative atomic mass. So what we do in order to work this out is we multiply the percentage abundance, which is 75%, by the mass, which is 35. We'll add that to the second one over here, the second isotope. So that's 25 multiplied by 37. And we divide all of that by 100. That will give us 2625 plus 925 over 100 to give us 3550 over 100 to give us 35.5 and you can see that the figure 35.5 is closer to 35 than it is to 37. That reflects the increased relative abundance of chlorine 35 as opposed to chlorine 37. In question one we're given a mass spectrum of element x. We're asked to calculate the relative atomic mass of element x and importantly we're asked to give our answer to two decimal places which is something we must remember to do. So let's take a look at the calculation that we're going to do. We're going to multiply the percentage relative abundance by the appropriate mass to charge ratio and then divide through by 100 as we know we should do. So we first of all have 78.70% and the mass charge ratio of that particular peak is 24. We're going to add the rest, so that's 10.13 multiplied by 25. And we're going to add to that our final peak of 11.17% multiplied by 26. We're going to divide through that whole thing by 100. That gives us, if you use a calculator, 24. 32.47 over 100, which is 24.3247. Now, importantly, we're asked to give our answer to two decimal places. So our answer is 24.32. One mark comes from our calculation and the correct calculation to begin with, and the second and final mark from a correct final answer given to two decimal places. In part B, we're then asked to suggest the identity of element X. Well, as we've calculated in part A, the relative atomic mass is 24.32, so around 24. So if we have a look at our periodic table, we can see that an element with a relative atomic mass 
of 24.3 is magnesium. So we can suggest that element X is indeed magnesium. A nice and simple suggest question there, applying the information that we have to the question, getting us that one mark. Moving on to question two. We're asked what happens to the particles in a mass spectrometer following vaporization and before they are detected. And secondly, we're asked which of these steps separates the isotopes. So we know the process involved in mass spectrometry. We know after vaporization, we then have ionization, followed by acceleration, and then we have deflection before detection. So those are the steps between vaporization and detection as we're asked to give in the question. We're then asked which of these steps separates the isotopes. Now we know that it's deflection that separates the isotopes and we know they're separated according to their mass to charge ratio. So there we go, we have our complete answer. So this question is worth a hefty four marks. The first three come from correctly identifying those three steps, ionisation, acceleration and deflection. And the final mark comes from stating which of the steps separates the isotopes. And we know that's deflection. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level chemistry resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap provide smiley face and together let's make A-level chemistry a walk in the park.